Welcome everyone. We'll take another minute to begin. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn, Adverse Religious Experiences and Conversionary Practices, Implications for Social Work. We will be taking another few moments to begin. Um, feel free to uh, make comments in the chat. We'll have a few moments at the end for questions. Uh, we are doing this in webinar format and Welcome to everyone who is watching this via YouTube. As we begin our Lunch and Learn Adverse Religious Experiences and Conversionary Practices, Implications for Social Work, we want to begin with a land acknowledgement. Please join with me in the chat and acknowledge the name of where you are located. You can use placenames.mapdev.ca. Uh, if you have a window, take a moment to look outside. If you have a picture or an image in your mind of a way that you can connect to Earth, take a few moments to take a deep breath and do so. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking from Unamagi. This is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq whose inherent rights were recognized in the Peace and Friendship Treaties that were signed with the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples from 1725 to 1779. A series of treaties did not surrender Indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in Section 35 of the Constitution Act in 1982. They remain active to this day. Let us take this time to pause in reflection and gratitude for the land where we live and work. The Nova Scotia College of Social Workers commits to translating this acknowledgement into action. By seeking to implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, especially those regarding education, we commit to doing what we can to becoming better treaty partners. We commit to learning and to unlearning. Let us take this moment to pause in gratitude for all who have and continue to heroically care and advocate for this beautiful land. May we join them in this sacred work. Let us ground ourselves in the wisdom of the land-based Mi'kmaq teachings and values that we must all begin to learn. Let us work to decolonize ourselves, our practice, and this community that we share by working for justice for all living beings as an expression of our gratitude for being here. Let us take a deep breath and we center ourselves away from the violent ways colonization fills our world and fills us. Let us take a deep breath and work on letting go of the unconscious bias that is everywhere, inside and out. May our session today lead us to be in right relationship with this land and with one another. We'll all leave. When we acknowledge the land, we must also begin to acknowledge the wisdom of this planet and align ourselves with its truths. To reflect upon this, let us continue to think about the deeper implications of this awakening and awareness as we reflect upon the themes of today's Lunch and Learn. Because our first topic to think about is trauma. So what is trauma? There's one definition. It is uh, individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. It is said that there are four requirements that have to be met for the brain to perceive and encode an event as trauma. There has to be an event. 
there has to be meaning that is ascribed to that event that the brain encodes as traumatic. There has to be a context um, what's defined as landscape, the existing neural landscape of the brain that has to be vulnerable to traumatization. So it's possible that it could be from larger systemic things. It could be because of uh, the brain's chemistry, perhaps because of previous adverse childhood relate childhood experiences or other situations. And then there has to be the feature of inescapability. So the person has to perceive the event as inescapable, to feel trapped in some way. So these four um, requirements, there has to be an event, there has to be meaning that is ascribed, there has to be a larger landscape, whether it's structural and external or internal in terms of the neural landscape of the brain. And then there has to be the perception of inescapability. And trauma can change our brain. So here you can see different brain scans that show how the brain is um, impacted by trauma. So you can see in the bottom left how the hippocampus of um, the brain will light up if it's healthy and will not light up if it's not. Um, you can see how there's differences in terms of which parts of the brain can be activated or not. It affects our concentration. It affects our ability to focus. And here you can see sort of the superimposition and comparison of trauma. TBI refers to traumatic brain injury. So PTSD is, you know, one type of trauma. Um, so you can see how both trauma and brain injuries can sometimes even work together, but how each reflect uh, ways that the brain is changed. And of course, the brain affects the rest of us, and it can lead to epigenetic consequences as well. It can lead to immune dysfunction, sleep issues, chronic pain, digestive issues. It can change all of the way our hormones function way we hear, the way we function, um, and it can impact our bodies and it can impact generations to come because the brain um, will translate that into genetic changes. And so trauma accumulates also over time and continues to impact us. When we think about the brain, we can think of multiple different components of the brain here you can see a few images about how the prefrontal cortex, the pituitary adrenal axis, the amygdala, which um, is wired for survival, um, and the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, differentiating between the past and the present, which is how sometimes trauma can flood us. Um, so we can see also how the prefrontal cortex, which regulates emotion, um, will also be what is helping to impact all of this. They all work together and the ways in which we think and perceive affect how we experience trauma, but it also is impacted by trauma. So that's part of the cyclical nature of trauma. It is said that it can cause fight or flight. And most of us are familiar with traumas affecting fight or flight. Uh, so, for example, it can cause tunnel vision, it can impact our hearing, it can impact our breathing, it impacts how our body um, translates glucose or processes glucose, it can impact our heart, accelerating it, affecting our hormones, our digestion. But actually, uh, increasingly, research is showing more than just fight or flight. Um, it can also lead to uh, what's called fawn, flop, freeze. Um, and here you actually see, if you look at the top of this uh, chart, you can see it almost like a continuum from fight to force to fawn. Fawn is really uh, an interesting one. It's where we start, start to begin to identify with our oppressor and internalize 
um, trauma so that we can protect ourselves by trying to traumatize ourselves so that other people don't. So it's almost like a, we force on ourselves. Flail and flop and freeze are some of the ways in which we sometimes are paralyzed almost by trauma. And then fidget and flight is sort of the attempt to escape. And so we can see that whole continuum. Here we can see alternative responses that um, help us begin to try to cope with trauma, whether it's focus, whether it's foundation, find framework, facts, forgive, faith, freedom. There's lots of different um, ways of trying to make sense of trauma and trying to cope with it. This, of course, is a much larger topic, but it's important to ground our conversation that is looking at conversionary experiences and adverse trauma, adverse religious experiences to understand the larger traumatic context of what can happen to us, the ways in which our trauma responses um, cause us to seek safety, uh, cause us to experience trauma and causes us to find ways of coping and making sense of the world. And to understand trauma within the larger context of intergenerational trauma, the ways in which we absorb and experience trauma and then the ways in which we sometimes pass it on to others. So that's true in terms of intergenerationally, but it's also true on a larger structural social level, whatever is true on a micro level is true on a mezzo and macro and systemic level and global level. That's part of the social work framework that we understand that everything that's true on a smaller level is true on a larger and vice versa. So what does that mean to us when we're working with clients, whether we're working in micro social work, counseling one-on-one uh, -on -one or with families or Within organizations, we can see these exact same systems and patterns. And when we look uh, on a macro political advocacy level, looking at larger systemic forces. So you can see on this cycle, the ways in which colonization, natural disasters, genocide, war um, can all be considered part of the larger systemic traumas that are impacting us on smaller micro levels. And we can see the ways in which uh, this impacts particularly vulnerable communities. And we started our Lunch and Learn with a land acknowledgement and an opportunity to reflect on the ways in which each of us are impacted by colonization and how we are part of this larger cycle and how that in itself contributes to our trauma and to the moral distress that uh, as if you look at our um, repositioning social work and mental health report, we can see that um, our social workers, our members here at the Nova Scotia College of Social Work, and we've seen research across the rest of Canada and tur the Turtle Island have severe moral distress because we're participating in larger systemic uh, forces and systems that have policies that perpetuate trauma and cause trauma. So how do we find ways of caring for ourselves, caring for one another, caring for those we serve, working to transform those systems? This is, of course, the quest that we have to figure out together. Um, now, when we're talking about religious trauma, which is, of course, the topic of today, um, it's important to think about the doctrine of discovery, which um, is part of the ways in which uh, we have entered into this land and taken control of it, um, the ways in which our ancestors were part of that. Uh, it, the doctrine of discovery um, talks about how if the land that we're on was not claimed in the name of Jesus, um, the Terra Nullius uh, doctrine talks about how um, if those who are living in the land were not um, were not believers of that particular religion, then it is considered nullius, empty, and it is being discovered. Even though, of course, the, there were plenty of people who are living in the land, 
because of the ways in which religion was coerced and co-opted and utilized as a weapon um, that in itself forms the framework of a lot of religious trauma, the ways in which residential schools, for example, were um, run by religious communities and social workers. And in fact, the roots of social work, as many of you know, find their roots in uh, religious uh, communities. Uh, we can see in different Protestant um, communities, some of the starting points, but really a lot of different religious traditions in the effort to try to help other people. Sometimes we unintentionally cause harm, sometimes we intentionally cause harm, or the systems, if we look at the ways colonization function in the world, um, there is a lot of intentional harm as well. And we know that this is ongoing, that, uh, for example, there are more indigenous children, BIPOC kids, who are um, in quote-unquote care um, of the government now than there were even in the time of the residential schools. So this work is ongoing, and it's therefore important to understand the, the roots of that and how that connects to religious trauma because part of unlearning colonization and working to heal the trauma as a result of it does involve looking at the ways in which there is that intersectionality, not only intersectionality between religion and colonization and political powers and different systemic governmental um, institutions, but also the ways in which intersectionality um, Function. So the intersectional wheel of power and privilege is one way that we think of how, whether we're Black, Indigenous, queer, um, uh, different identities, that we are all impacted differently by colonization. Um, and that is part of the trauma that causes a certain degree of splitting, which is another trauma response. Um, so let's focus on adverse religious experiences more fully. These are any experience of a religious belief, practice, or structure that undermines an individual's sense of safety or autonomy, negatively impacts their physical, social, emotional, relational, sexual, or psychological well-being. And these have the potential of it resulting in trauma. There are no set parameters for consulting uh, adverse religious experiences, but they are generally categorized into three sections, abuse, neglect, and communal practices. Um, and we can see this on many different levels, um, but the, the reality is, is that uh, survivors of residential schools, as well as people who identify as queer, transgender, tend to be amongst those that have most frequently experienced adverse religious experiences. Common traits of these can be seen if we look at under the abuse category. Um, there can be emotional, verbal, physical, or sexual in the neglect category as well. And we can see that different practices contribute to this, whether it's violence, threat, bullying, public outing or stigmatizing, forced confessions, um, shunning, excommunicating, disowning, um, brainwashing, forced indoctrination, <laughs> scapegoating, othering, identity disruption, uh, isolation. We can see a variety of different strategies. Um, conversion therapy is one component of it. And it's really important uh, when we talk about conversion therapy, which we will in a little bit, that it's not actually therapy, of course. It's uh, So a lot of people are increasingly putting it in either parentheses or quotation marks. It's a conversion practice. And we will talk a little more about that. So we can see a variety of other um, behaviors, ways in which uh, different attitudes or practices can contribute to a, it, an individual or community's uh, adverse religious experiences. The term religious trauma refers to the lasting adverse effects on a person's physical, mental, social, emotional, spiritual well-being after 
an adverse religious experience or experiences has occurred. There is, of course, overlap and influence between the two terms, but they are not quite the same thing. This is more like the culmination. Um, and it can lead to chronic anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, nightmares, sleeping disorders, self-harm, chronic shame, fear, stress, and um, variety of health issues, as well as relationship and social issues. And we can understand all this and more based on what we saw earlier in terms of what trauma is. The trauma can come to us from many different ways, but many of us don't talk about or think about the ways in which religious trauma can be one of the ways that people experience trauma, which then can contribute to people being concerned anytime people even inadvertently bring up uh, or trigger that trauma. So even something seemingly innocuous and kind, like God bless you, or um, putting up Christmas decorations at uh, in your office, for example, or even what we think of as seasonal decorations, can sometimes trigger people who've experienced religious trauma, who, in order to function, are trying to separate themselves from the source of their trauma or anything that might trigger them. So for those of us that have never experienced religious trauma, um, we may not realize the ways in which this can be true because for many people who've not experienced this, religion and spirituality is the source of great strength and resilience and meaning and purpose and coping. Um, certainly several communities, uh, for example, um, communities uh, uh, like the Black Church has served, for example, as a source of great comfort to many, many people. Although um, if you've had a chance to see Vincent Musso's um, Lunch and Learn on uh, the identity development of Black, trans, or queer um, folk, you can see how those people with intersectional identities, for example, somebody who um, identifies as gay may not find the same degree of comfort because we live in a world where you just have to look at the news in the States, but also in Canada and elsewhere, um, the ways in which some religious communities do um, try to insert hatred into religious doctrine, which can be, of course, very triggering for many people. So it's important to understand that religious trauma is a form of trauma, and um, it is it represents the physical, emotional, and psychological response to religious beliefs, practices, and structures that can overwhelm an individual's ability to cope and their ability to return to a sense of safety. Uh, the Religious Trauma Institute uh, is one organization that has a lot more research on this, if you are interested and want to learn more about it, there are a growing number, admittedly small, but growing number of therapists that specialize in working with um, people who've experienced religious trauma. It's a very special kind of trauma, and it does take a degree of training. And hopefully today that sensitization and awareness will grow for you and hopefully you will continue to want to learn and study on this topic. Conversion therapy or conversion therapy practices is um, one type of effort. Um, it is generally spoken about in terms of uh, queer, transgender, non-binary folks. Um, and so you can see here on this slide the ways in which conversion therapy is sort of like the pinnacle, um, but it, or um, and again, I want to specify therapy in quotation marks because there's nothing therapeutic or positive or healing about conversion efforts. And increasingly, um, we use uh, S-O-G-I-E-C-E -E, um, to refer to sexual orientation and gender identity and expression change efforts um, and how that is really the outgrowth growth of the binary cis sexism, heterosexist model. Um, but this is really just one part of the ways in which colonization functions as a type of conversion practice to force people to be a certain way. 
So we can see, for example, the ways in which gender and sexuality was weaponized as part of the colonial quest. For example, um, gender, right? We see uh, indigenous communities that had um, suddenly men's hair had to be cut, men had to look a certain way. Chiefs were elevated up as part of that so that men would be in charge. So we can see the ways in which misogyny is part of the colonial quest. And um, for example, the, the imposition of a binary model of gender, you are either male and female, you have to be heterosexual or you are deviant. That notion is part of colonization um, and it is grounded in a Christian theology. So for example, um, other religious traditions do not have that. Like in Judaism, for example, we believe in eight genders. Um, and in other religious traditions, we see different components of that. So for example, in indigenous communities, the notion of two-spirit individuals is something that challenges the binary. Um, and so when we think of conversion practices, it's really important to contextualize a lot of the queer phobia, transphobia, and um, misogyny that exists in our current social structures within the larger colonial quest so that we can begin to liberate even communities of faith from the ways in which colonization um, has co-opted for uh, the purpose of conquest of land, resources, um, and uh, the ways in which even if we think of the practice of war, for example, uh, rape is a huge part of that. Um, and so these practices are, as this slide says, only the tip of the iceberg. So it is important for us to have a better understanding of the conversion therapy practices, conversion practices, and to understand it within the larger context. It's also really important to understand it because it is now illegal in Canada to engage in any practice that can be trying to alter a person's sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression, be it through psychological, medical, or faith-based, or religious methods and practices. So according to the criminal code, Conversion therapy means a practice, treatment, or service that is designed to A, change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual, B, change a person's gender identity to cisgender, C, change a person's gender expression so it conforms to the sex that was assigned to the person at birth, D, repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior. So that refers to hate the sin, not the sinner kind of language. E, repress a person's non cisgender identity, or repress a, or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the sex assigned to the person at birth. So according to the Canada's criminal code, these this is the definition. But for us social workers that believe in critical thinking and that understand the intersectionality of oppression and prejudice, we understand that all communities have aspects of these conversion practices um, as part of the colonial quest and that all of us are impacted differently. The therapy pyramid, the conversion pyramid that I showed at the beginning, um, impacts health and well-being. Um, and it's important to recognize that these uh, practices are not neatly separated. In many cases, what starts off as one can lead to the next. And these all contribute to negative health effects and uh, trauma and it can lead to poor self-esteem, self-hatred, anxiety, depression, substance use, social isolation, loneliness, suicidal ideation, and self-harm. And anything can enable that that is linked to the binary. Um, so for example, having bathrooms that are only one or the other 
means that everyone that doesn't fit in those categories is forced to choose or forced to hold it in. That's a, an example of a small but daily and multiple times a day experience that can contribute to triggering. So in the same ways we talked about religious trauma that, uh, for example, uh, God bless you or Christmas decorations, seemingly lovely uh, behaviors can trigger someone who had a previous experience of trauma. So too can something that many cisgendered folks don't think twice about, like having to go to the bathroom, having only two bathroom options, cause daily and multiple times a day regular trauma. So please check out on our YouTube channel if you haven't. Our big ideas in mental health, um, protecting the um, health and well-being of transgender and non-binary kids um, as one example of how the lack of accessible, inclusive bathrooms is a violation of the, the conversion practices laws and um, one of the many things that our social justice committee is advocating for as part of our own intersectional um, commitment to decolonizing and social justice advocacy. So conversion quote unquote therapy can happen in many places as you see here. It can happen obviously in religious communities, but it can happen in the community more broadly. It can happen in a counseling setting, for example, um, many people, and I can say this very easily because I have had therapists at different times try to tell me that my gender dysphoria, my discomfort in my own body um, is really just uh, low self-esteem about my body. And I just have to learn to love myself. And um, that sounds really nice, except that for um some of us that actually contributes to dissociation and harm. Um, so understanding the ways in which uh, gender and gender identity and sexual identity, those are different, right? Being gay and being transgender, non-binary are different. They have different concepts. So if I am attracted to someone, that's one thing. How I feel within my own body is different. And that starts much, much earlier. So the moment a child is told, you have to go in this bathroom instead of this bathroom, in that moment, that's when many kids begin to feel like something is not right. Um, and they begin to, for example, dissociate from their bodies. Um, and those little traumas are magnified when they're forced to wear certain clothes that don't align with their identity or other things that will cause them to be traumatized. And that's one of the reasons why increasingly science and research are showing that the well-being of children depends on their ability to be themselves as early as possible. As soon as we start splitting from our body and being forced to engage in conversion practices, that can happen in kindergarten. Okay, all the boys on one side, all the girls on the other, let's play a game. Oh, what are you doing on that side? You're supposed to be on this side. You're a girl or you're a boy. In those little moments, harm is conducted. And um, now, according to the Criminal Code of Canada, those little moments like, okay, we're going to have to play a game in school, all the boys play against the girls. In those little moments, we see the beginning of conversion practices, which can cause tremendous harm and is now um, illegal. So sexual orientation was added, for example, to the Nova Scotia Human Rights Act and the Canadian Human Rights Act in 1996. Gender identity and gender expression were added to the Nova Scotia Human Rights Act in 2012 and in the Canadian Human Rights Act in 2017. So this has been around for a while um, and Canada was also the fourth nation in the world to recognize and allow same gender marriage. Um, so these are ways in which we have been working towards collectively um, reconciliation and justice um, in this particular area, but there's still so much more work to be done as our recent Lunch and Learn 
um, showed with our big panels and we saw, uh, had a child who just graduated high school who shared how they were told not to use the bathroom that aligned with their gender identity and how they were misgendered during their graduation ceremony. So we see that there continues to be deep harm. That's an example of a conversion practice. So every time someone misgenders someone, is even if it's unintentional, because we live in a colonized world um, where it is deeply ingrained in our brain and it's really hard to unlearn a habit, um, nevertheless, it can cause harm to someone. And by the way, if you misgender someone, don't turn it into a bigger deal because that just adds to the trauma. Just be like, I'm sorry, I messed up. I am still working to unlearn the ways in which colonization teaches me binaries. Um, there it is. Um, so what do the new criminal code provisions mean? And what does this mean to us as social workers? Right, so Bill C-4, um, an act to amend the criminal code on this issue um, passed. And so the, we have the definition and um, there are now four offenses as a result of the new criminal code provisions. Um, so causing someone to undergo these practices, including by providing it, doing anything for the purpose of removing a child from Canada with the intention that the child undergo these practices outside of Canada. So for example, there are tons and tons of disturbing amounts of this in the States, um, many of them in communities of faith, but we know there are even some communities of faith, um, even in uh, the Maritimes where um, there are some of these practices that are continuing to happen covertly and so there's efforts to try to address that that are happening um, but also any kind of material benefit that might come from this these are all um, considered illegal and we might think that again this is something very uh, extreme but if 67% uh, of um, and these statistics come from the legal information Society of Nova Scotia. So um, we know that these reflect the more local statistics. 67% of queer individuals state that they had experienced conversion therapy practices in religious, spiritual, or faith-based settings. So that's a really significant number. And so that's really where the intersection of religious trauma and conversion therapy practices lies and where we need to be thinking about. And we also see that uh, many of these practices, we see 72% occurred before the person turned 20 years old, which is why our Big Ideas panel was focused on protecting kids and why there are efforts, especially in the um, French Acadian School Board, to um, to limit this, um, and why we are advocating for uh, first voice representation at every um, decision table where decisions are made about kids. It's really important for someone who is themselves transgender or non-binary to be at that table because a lot of people don't understand how they might be accidentally or unintentionally dealing with this. And this is the importance of first voice representation. So for example, there are um, bathrooms that have been created in many schools um, that are all in all gender bathrooms. Of course, many of them are at the ends of the school, very far away on different floors. Kids have to travel so that in itself forms as a uh, unintentional barrier to encourage kids to use the bathroom next door to them instead of having to go three flights down to get it but if they do go three flights down to get it many times those bathrooms are closed because there's a concern maybe kids are smoking now of course smoking in schools is not ideal and is very problematic so, of course, people made a decision that they felt was in the best interest of the child to protect them from smoke by locking those 
bathrooms that are at the edge of the ta- the schools. And um, if a person doesn't have the lens of first voice experience, which many people who are not transgender, non-binary, or related to someone who are, um, may not understand how that decision uh, to clock those bathrooms means that multiple kids are, for example, caught experiencing great harm. So we learned of this situation because there were doctors who were reporting that they had kids with um, physical issues, urinary issues, um, bladder infections, things that were happening as a result of holding it in because they couldn't go to the bathroom of their choosing and going to other bathrooms caused them deep psychological harm. And so we see the ways in which these unintentional practices are causing harm and how this is happening very early. Um, This is just one example of the kinds of things that impact child development or adverse childhood experiences we know can contribute to long lasting harm later in life. We know that kids are who experience adverse trauma, bullying, violence, um, other forms of uh, trauma can be at a much higher risk of having stroke, cancer, um, heart disease, uh, chronic health issues, psychological health issues, relationship issues later in life um, because of, as we saw, the brain that gets wired differently as a result of that trauma. Uh, You can learn more about this from the um, Let Me Be Me guide, which um, you can find on Legal Info Nova Scotia. Or one of the things that we really want to call your attention to is uh, the Community-Based Research Center has a variety of different resources. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that in a few moments. But these resources are really useful. And in fact, we are working with them on our new guidelines for clinical counseling to ensure that our guidelines align with the guidelines they've been developing to address conversion therapy practices. Because um, they are, that's one example of how a clinician's personal bias or lack of experience in um, the ways in which the person they're treating might have a different experience or need than what they themselves know from their lived experience, how that gap between provider's experience and client's experience in that gap can be a variety of unconscious defense mechanisms or just not knowing or understanding and how that can unintentionally cause harm. And uh, these conversion practices, while of course the the legal definitions are very focused on gender and sexuality, um, they we can see how this might be true in other areas as well. If we think about the intersectional wheel and the ways in which many um, colonial institutions, policies, and practices are um, weighted so that those in the center who are cisgendered, white, heterosexual, Christian men with education, and um, who are citizens, if we think about the intersectional wheel, all of those can um, sometimes contribute to uh, feeling like if you are other, whatever that other looks like, you are excluded. So it's a critical lens thinking about this law as social workers who are steeped in intersectionality and steeped in systems theory. Um, And if you're interested in systems theory, we are gonna be having uh, once again, our um, eight week course in systems theory. And we also will be having And that's going to be in November and December. And in uh, January, we will be having a learning cohort specifically on looking at unconscious bias and uh, and psychodynamic theory, the ways in which we can become more aware of our unconscious. So 
these are just some of the ways that we at the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers are committed to a safer social work practice and promoting safe communities, especially for those that have been historically marginalized and oppressed so that we can work towards our uh, values of social justice. And our new code of ethics, which um, is getting ready to get adopted over this coming year, is a new vision of what ethics as social work looks like. One that says it's not enough to be not racist, not queerphobic. Um, that is not enough. We have to be anti. We have to be actively working to dismantle systemic bias in everything and in everyone, but especially within ourselves, our unconscious and our practice, that that is an ethical mandate that our new code of ethics is going to require of all of us. We already have that um, in our uh, professional development requirements. So for example, today's lunch and learn will fit under the diversity and education requirement so that we can learn how to provide safer care for those that have been historically harmed by colonization, of which two-spirit, queer, transgender, and non-binary folks, asexual folks, um, are amongst those, as well as gay and lesbian, queer, pan, the, the full spectrum. Um, those are some of the ways in which conversion practices happen. And uh, we look forward to dialoguing with each of you about ways that you might see these similar patterns in other contexts. And in a few moments, I will be stopping this um, Lunch and Learn presentation so that we can have a little bit of dialogue together. But it's important for us to recognize the somatic experience of trauma that can emerge from uh, these conversion practices uh, and specifically the ways in which there's not even a lot of knowledge and understanding around it. So if you go to, um, if you go to the CBRC, you will see this is actually taken from their website. Um, they are working on Advocacy to stop this just because it's illegal doesn't mean that people aren't still doing it, right? Our letter to the to the Minister of Education, Community Services, Mental Health, and Health more broadly states that uh, there, wherever there are no all-inclusive bathrooms, we see conversion practices, right? If you if you go somewhere and you see only two binary options for gender that is a form of conversion practice. That is actually illegal. It is causing harm. It is contributing to the slow erosion of self of people who identify as transgender and non-binary. It is contributing to harm and it is illegal. And so from a social justice perspective, we have an ethical mandate to be working to dismantle binary systems, which is one of the many ways in which colonization continues its influence. There's so many other ways. And so that's why um, uh, for our next strategic plan, which we are working on, we are hoping to embed deep in the core of who the Nova Scotia College of Social Work is becoming um, uh, an organization of made up of social workers who are actively committed to fulfilling our new code of ethics which requires and mandates us to be actively working to dismantle racism, white supremacy, queer phobia, transphobia, all of the ways in which colonization is at the core of the creation of that intersectional wheel of power and privilege that causes lateral violence, that causes us to compete against one another. So it's important to know, for example, here there's a survivor support network 
Um, you can learn more about that as well on the website um, and different resources. They're actually working on a brand new set of guidelines specifically for how therapists and clinicians can um, engage in supporting people who've experienced this. If you're interested in learning more, please let me know and I am happy to connect you with them. Or you can just go to the CBRC um, Community-Based Research Center and you can see all of this. And so with that, I am going to stop um, the recording and the screen share and open it up for dialogue and questions and conversation. So thank you all very much for listening and